God found that he could do nothing with them, and he said, I will drown them all, except a few. And he picked out a fellow by the name of Noah that had been a bachelor for five hundred years. If I had to drown anybody, I would have drowned him. I believe that Noah had then been married something like one hundred years. God told him to build a boat, and he built one five hundred feet long, eighty or ninety feet broad, and fifty-five feet high, with one door shutting on the outside, and one window twenty-two inches square. If Noah had any hobby in the world, it was ventilation. Then into this ark he put a certain number of all the animals in the world. Naturalists have ascertained that at that time there were at least 1,100,000 insects necessary to go into the ark, about 40,000 mammalia, 1,600 reptiles, to say nothing of the mastodon, the elephant, and the animalcule, of which thousands live upon a single leaf, and which cannot be seen by the naked eye. Noah had no microscope, and yet he had to pick them out by pairs. You have no idea the trouble that man had. Some say that the flood was not universal, that it was partial. Why then did God say, I will destroy every living thing beneath the heavens? If it was partial, why did Noah save the birds? An ordinary bird, tending strictly to business, can beat a partial flood. Why did he put the birds in there, the eagles, the vultures, the condors, if it was only a partial flood? And how did he get them in there? Were they inspired to go there, or did he drive them up? Did the polar bear leave his home of ice and start for the tropic, inquiring for Noah? Or could the kangaroo come from Australia, unless he was inspired, or somebody was behind him? Then there are animals on this hemisphere, not on that. How did he get them across? And there are some animals which would be very unpleasant in an ark, unless the ventilation was very perfect. When he got the animals in the ark, God shut the door, and Noah pulled down the window. And then it began to rain. And it kept on raining until the water went twenty-nine feet over the highest mountain. Chimborazo, then as now, lifted its head above the clouds, and then as now, there sat the condor. And yet the waters rose and rose over every mountain in the world, twenty-nine feet above the highest peaks, covered with snow and ice. How deep were these waters? about five and a half miles. How long did it rain? Forty days. How much did it have to rain a day? About eight hundred feet. How is that for dampness? No wonder they said the windows of the heavens were open. If I had been there, I would have said the whole side of the house was out. How long were they in this ark? A year and ten days, floating around with no rudder, no sail, nobody on the outside at all. The window was shut, and there was no door except the one that shut on the outside. Who ran this ark? Who took care of it? Finally, it came down on Mount Ararat, a peak 17,000 feet above the level of the sea, and with about 3,000 feet of snow, and it stopped there simply to give the animals from the tropics a chance. Then Noah opened the window and got a breath of fresh air and let out all the animals, and then Noah took a drink, and God made a bargain with him that he would not drown us any more. And he put a rainbow in the clouds and said, When I see that, I will recollect that I have promised not to drown you. Because if it was not for that, he is apt to drown us at any minute. Now can anybody believe that that is the origin of the rainbow? Are you not all familiar with the natural causes which bring those beautiful arches before our eyes? Then the people started out again, and they were as bad as before. Here, let me ask why God did not make Noah in the first place. He knew he would have to drown Adam and Eve and all his family. Then another thing, why did he want to drown the animals? What had they done? What crime had they committed? It is very hard to answer these questions. That is, for a man who has only been born once. 
After a while, they tried to build a tower to get into heaven, and the gods heard about it and said, let's go down and see what man is up to. They came and found things a great deal worse than they thought, and thereupon he confounded the language to prevent them succeeding, so that the fellow up above could not shout down mortar or brick to the one below, and they had to give it up. Is it possible that anyone believes that that is the reason why we have the variety of languages in the world? Do you know that language is born of human experience and is a physical science? Do you know that every word has been suggested in some way by the feelings or observations of man, that there are words as tender as the dawn, as serene as the stars, and others as wild as the beasts? Do you know that language is dying and being born continually, that every language has its cemetery and its cradle, its bud and blossom and withered leaf? Man has loved, enjoyed, and suffered, and language is simply the expression he gives those experiences. Then the world began to divide, and the Jewish nation was started. Now I want to say that at one time your ancestors, like mine, were barbarians. If the Jewish people had to write these books now, they would be civilized books, and I do not hold them responsible for what their ancestors did. We find the Jewish people first in Canaan, and there were seventy of them, counting Joseph and his children already in Egypt. They lived two hundred and fifteen years, and they then went down into Egypt and stayed there 215 years. They were 430 years in Canaan and Egypt. How many did they have when they went to Egypt? Seventy. How many were they at the end of 215 years? Three millions. That is a good many. We had at the time of the revolution in this country three millions of people. Since that time, there have been four doubles until we have 48 millions today. How many would the Jews number at the same ratio in 215 years? Call it eight doubles and we have 40,000. But instead of 40,000, they had three millions. How do I know they had three millions? Because they had 600,000 men of war. For every honest voter in the state of Illinois, there will be five other people, and there are always more voters than men of war. They must have had, at the lowest possible estimate, three millions of people. Is that true? Is there a minister in the city of Chicago that will testify to his own idiocy by claiming that they could have increased to three millions by that time? If there is, let him say so. Do not let him talk about the civilizing influence of a lie. When they got into the desert, they took a census to see how many firstborn children there were. They found they had 20,273 firstborn males. It is reasonable to suppose there was about the same number of firstborn girls, or 45,000 firstborn children. There must have been about as many mothers as firstborn children. Dividing three millions by 45,000 mothers, you will find that the women in Israel had to have, on the average, 68 children apiece. Some stories are too thin. This is too thick. Now we know that among three million people, there will be about 300 births a day. And according to the Old Testament, whenever a child was born, the mother had to make a sacrifice, a sin offering for the crime of having been a mother. If there is in this universe anything that is infinitely pure, it is a mother with her child in her arms. Every woman had to have a sacrifice of a couple of pigeons, and the priest had to eat those pigeons in the most holy place. At that time, there were at least 300 births a day, and the priests had to cook and eat these pigeons in the most holy place, and at that time there were only three priests. 200 birds apiece per day. I look upon them as the champion bird-eaters of the world. Then where were these Jews? They were upon the desert of Sinai, and Sahara compared to that is a garden. Imagine an ocean of lava torn by storm and vexed by tempest, suddenly gazed at by a gorgon and changed to stone. 
Such was the desert of Sinai. The whole supplies of the world could not maintain three millions of people on the desert of Sinai for forty years. It would cost one hundred thousand millions of dollars and would bankrupt Christendom. And yet there they were with flocks and herds, so many that they sacrificed over one hundred and fifty thousand first-born lambs at one time. It would require millions of acres to support these flocks, and yet there was no blade of grass, and there is no account of it raining baled hay. They sacrificed 150,000 lambs, and the blood had all to be sprinkled on the altar within two hours, and there were only three priests. They would have to sprinkle the blood of 1,250 lambs per minute, then all the people gathered in front of the tabernacle, eighteen feet deep. Three millions of people would make a column six miles long. Some reverend gentlemen say they were ninety feet deep. Well, that would make a column of over a mile. Where were these people going? They were going to the Holy Land. How large was it? Twelve thousand square miles, one-fifth the size of Illinois a frightful country covered with rocks and desolation. There never was a land agent in the city of Chicago that would not have blushed with shame to have described that land as flowing with milk and honey. Do you believe that God Almighty ever went into partnership with hornets? Is it necessary unto salvation? God said to the Jews, I will send hornets before you to drive out the Canaanites. How would a hornet know a Canaanite? Is it possible that God inspired the hornets, that he granted letters of mark and reprisal to hornets? I am willing to admit that nothing in the world would be better calculated to make a man leave his native country than a few hornets attending strictly to business. God said, Kill the Canaanites slowly. Why? Lest the beast of the field increase upon you. How many Jews were there? Three millions. Going to a country, how large? Twelve thousand square miles. But were there nations already in this holy land? Yes, there were seven nations mightier than the Jews. Say there would be twenty-one millions when they got there, or twenty-four millions with themselves. Yet they were told to kill them slowly, lest the beasts of the field increase upon them. Is there a man in Chicago that believes that? Then what does he teach it to little children for? Let him tell the truth. So the same God went into partnership with snakes. The children of Israel lived on manna. One account says all the time and another only a little while. That is the reason there is a chance for commentaries and you can exercise faith. If the book was reasonable, everybody could get to heaven in a moment. But whenever it looks as if it could not be that way, and you believe, you are almost a saint. And when you know it is not that way and believe, you are a saint. He fed them on manna. Now manna is very peculiar stuff. It would melt in the sun, and yet they used to cook it by seething and baking. I would as soon think of frying snow and boiling icicles. But this manna had other peculiar qualities. It shrank to an omer, no matter how much they gathered, and swelled up to an omer, no matter how little they gathered. What a magnificent thing manna would be for the currency, shrinking and swelling according to the volume of business. There was not a change in the bill of fare for forty years, and they knew that God could just as well give them three square meals a day. They remembered about the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions in Egypt, and they said, Our souls abhorreth this light bread. Then this God got mad. You know cooks are always touchy. And thereupon he sent snakes to bite the men, women, and children. He also sent them quails in wrath and anger, and while they had the flesh between their teeth, he struck thousands of them dead. He always acted in that way, all of a sudden. People had no chance to explain, no chance to move for a new trial, nothing. 
I want to know if it is reasonable he should kill people for asking for one change of diet in 40 years.